Number 10, Joseph Mangeli. All right, I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. This man is the only entry from the Second World War on today's list, and that's mainly because online guidelines make it practically impossible for me to talk about the evil German dictator or members of his party. So also known as the Angel of Death, Dr. Joseph was an anthropologist and SS physician who conducted numerous inhumane medical experiments on the prisoners at Auschwitz. So at Auschwitz, he was one of a number of medical professionals who selected victims to be sentenced to the gas chambers or be spared for his experimental research. He would attempt red fluid transfusions from one twin to another, do amputations to try and sew that part onto another twin, stitch two twins together to form Siamese twins, infect one twin with typhus or another disease, and uh, way too many other experiments. Can you tell he liked twins? And to the surprise of no one, more often than not, the twins would pass away during the procedures, or you know, he would just have them killed afterwards so he could do an autopsy for funsies. If one twin died from a disease, yeah, the other one's going just to mark the differences between the sick and healthy subjects. The evil doctor was also very interested in heterochromia, where people have irises of different colors, and he would uh, collect eyes and body parts of his victims and send it off for research. He would inject chemicals in victims' eyes to attempt to change their eye color. Now remember, this was before the age of colored contacts. He also experimented on pregnant women before sending them off to the gas chambers and caused incestuous pregnancies, always under the guise of research. Now he tried sex change operations, he tried removing organs, and operating on victims without anesthesia. Oh, and if that wasn't disgusting enough, he tried to prove that Jewish and Romani people were genetically inferior through his morbid experimentation. Throughout his time at Auschwitz, Joseph sent his colleagues in Germany red fluid, body parts, organs, skeletons, and even fetuses that have been taken from prisoners. Yay. Number 9. Putin Well, Vladimir Putin started off reasonably well you know, in his career, although there are um, some stories that his cronies planted explosives in Russian apartment buildings to help him snatch that presidency back in 1999. Granted, the folks who tell those truths keep going missing, so I'll get the Cliff's Notes version and pray I don't get nuked on the spot. One month after then-President Boris Yeltsin plucked Putin from obscurity, oh and by the way, he was a KGB official at the time, which yeesh, and made him prime minister, an explosion leveled a nine-story apartment building on Moscow's outskirts. Sidebar, if you don't know what the KGB was other than me shuddering just now, they were a security agency that make all the other ones in the world look like young folks trying to enforce rules for funsies. The pre-dawn blast on September 9th of 1999 reduced the building to a smoking pile of rubble, killing more than 100 people. A second building, less than 600 kilometers away, was rocked by an explosion on September 13th, killing 119 this time. Days earlier, a car exploded in a small town bordering the war-ravaged region of Chechnya, where reignited fighting was already spilling into neighboring regions. That blast outside the apartment building in the town of Buynask killed dozens. If I got the name wrong, I apologize. I'm not the best with every language. French and English are my forte for a reason. It was followed seven days later by a truck explosive that destroyed a nine-story building in another southern city, killing 17. On September 23rd, Putin asserted to the, you know, everybody, that bad guys in Chechnya were to blame and ordered a massive air campaign within the North Caucasus region. When asked a day later about the campaign targeting what he called terrorists, Putin responded with the phrase that will forever be his catchphrase. We will pursue them everywhere. We'll catch them in the toilet. We'll wipe them out in the outhouse. The statement became a Putin catchphrase and uh, set the tone for the 20 years of rule that followed. The longer he's in power, the more evil he's become. Leveling Grozny, attacking Georgia, grabbing the Crimea, carpet kabooming in Syria, imprisoning, poisoning, and assassinating opponents and, you know, muzzling the free press. When one would think, you know, oh, it can't get worse. Yeah, he had another surprise. The unprovoked attack of Ukraine, which, you know, an independent and peaceful nation back in February of 2022. But thanks to the heroism of the Ukrainian people, it's not completely the walkover he expected. So fingers crossed he maybe gets uh, voted out in the next election. Granted, it's a little tricky when people who oppose him have that weird coincidental habit of going missing. Number 8. Korean Kims It's pretty difficult to distinguish between these two evil leaders, father and son, of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. It's a country led by a dictator where the people have no say, and a monarchy with the father being succeeded by the son. Over time, there's actually been three Kims in that family that suggests that uh, being evil might just be like a generational thing, you know, part of your genetics, kind of like having an oily nose is one of mine. Under Papa Kim Jong II, aka the dear leader, which is a bucket of irony I don't have time to unpack, millions of folks died because of food scarcity. Amnesty International condemned him for leaving millions of North Koreans in poverty and detaining hundreds of thousands of people in prison camps, where, yeah, a lot of them died. Now, baby-faced Kim Jong-un was not much of an improvement. Human rights are non-existent, and his true or imagined opponents, or people he just doesn't like, are killed with methods that are going to give me nightmares for the rest of the year. While the general population suffers, the Kims spend whatever money they have on the development of nuclear weapons, because, you know, 
why not just make things worse? Number 7 Dr. Phil First, it's very important to understand that Dr. Phil is not a real doctor anymore. While he does have a PhD in psychology and used to have a license, he is no longer a licensed psychologist and cannot legally practice in the state of California, where he lives and films a show. Now, emphasis on used to. Look, while I can't state with certainty why he is no longer licensed, if you go back to 1988, a decade before his first appearance on Oprah, a 19 year old client of his alleged that he carried on an unprofessional sexual relationship with her, would touch her inappropriately, and intentionally kept her totally dependent on him. The Texas State Board of Examiners of Psychologists, try saying that five times fast, investigated the accusations, along with claims that Dr. Phil inappropriately provided this young lady with part time temporary employment while still carrying on a therapeutic relationship. Their findings never referenced the accusations of sexual misconduct, but they did discover that the doctor sustained an improper dual relationship with the client by acting both as her therapist and her employer. The board issued him a letter of reprimand, assigned a psychologist to monitor his practice, and required him to take an ethics class and a complete psychological evaluation. Whatever the reason may be, Phil McGraw is no longer a licensed psychologist and he hasn't been for quite a while. He believes that his show's primary goal is to let people know that it's okay to treat problems and get help, and deliver understandable information about how to live one's life. Which, you know, that's a cute soundbite and all. But Dr. Phil's show regularly exploits people with serious mental illnesses and disabilities for financial and entertainment purposes, if you can even call that entertainment. In one instance, Todd Herzog, a former winner of the hit reality TV show Survivor, appeared on the show in 2013 to discuss his drinking problem. However, he was so drunk that he had to be carried onto the set and lifted into a chair. Before you wonder why a supposedly trained psychologist is something so cruel as to put a man too drunk to walk on national TV, first consider the horrendously immoral and unethical actions that led to this situation. According to Herzog, he was set up. His dressing room came with a full bottle of of, um, spicy juice. After drinking all of it, a staff member supposedly handed him a Xanax, which he took before he even went on stage. Which, all of this doesn't even scrape the surface of the accusations of misconduct and bad psychology that have followed Dr. Phil throughout his career. If I were to say all of those, I'd be here all day. Number 6, Osama bin Laden. Yeah, he doesn't really need an introduction. Remember 9 11? Yeah, he was the organizer and mastermind, sending himself and way too many innocents to their death. He became America's most wanted, and justice was, you know, finally served on May 2nd of 2011 at 1 a.m. Thank you, Navy SEALs. They also found um, a huge stash of no no tapes in his compound, because apparently the self righteous threat persecuting women for being loose was not above sampling the strictly condemned fruits himself. Number 5, Bill Cosby. It emerged in late 2014 that the famed actor, formerly known as America's Dad, sexually harmed dozens of women throughout his career. Cosby was accused by over 60 women of bad things that I can't word. The earliest incidents allegedly took place in the mid-1960s, but dates of the alleged incidents continue all the way up to 2008 in 10 US states and in one Canadian province. Now, Cosby has maintained his innocence and repeatedly denied the allegations made against him. Most of the alleged acts fall outside the statute of limitations for criminal legal proceedings, but criminal charges were filed against him in one case, and numerous civil lawsuits were brought against him. As of November 2018, I believe eight related silver suits were active. In July of 2015, some court records were unsealed and released to the public from a specific civil suit, and a full transcription of its deposition was released by a court reporting service. In his testimony, Cosby admitted to casual sex involving recreational use of the sedative quaaludes with a series of young women, and he acknowledged that his dispensing of the prescription drug was illegal. In December of that year, three Class II felony charges of aggravated indecent harm were filed against Cosby in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, based on allegations concerning incidents in January of 04. Now, Cosby was found guilty of three counts of aggravated indecent harm at retrial on April 26th of 2018, and on September 25th of the same year, he was sentenced to 3 to 10 years in state prison and fined $25,000 plus the cost of the prosecution. So, 43000 something? In 2014, Judy Huth filed a civil suit against Cosby in California, alleging that he had her in 1975 when she was too young to consent. That trial began in 2022, and thankfully the jury ruled in Huth's favor. So, good riddance. Number 4, Elvis. Although everyone knows he famously met wife Priscilla Presley when she was only 14, that wasn't the only time he fraternized with folks that were a little too young. According to a former member of his entourage, Elvis was fascinated with the idea of real young girls. He was particularly obsessed with virginal ones, which he called cherries, and excuse me while I retch. According to Baby Let's Play House, Elvis felt insecure about pleasing older woman, and would invite groups of young fans to his house for sleepovers instead. And once he met Priscilla, those fantasies didn't change. Determined to keep her virginal until their wedding day, uh, he would instead have roleplay sessions where she would dress up like a schoolgirl and he would dress up like a teacher. Once the two married and had their first spawn, however, 
escapade stopped. Priscilla wrote in her memoir that Elvis had mentioned to her before they were married that he had never been able to make love to a woman who had given birth. When Elvis finally upgraded to adult woman, dating 21 year old beauty queen Ginger Eldon after his divorce from Priscilla, he continued to treat them like crap. Ginger wrote in her memoir that Elvis once fired a pistol into her bedroom when she refused to bring him yogurt. Lovely. Number three, Vlad the Impaler. Also known as Vlad Dracula, he was Prince of Wallachia three times between 1448 and his death in around 1476 or 77. The character of Dracula was loosely based on Vlad due to his sadistic personality and cruel acts done to the people of Wallachia, where he reigned as prince three times between 1448 to 1462 and killed about oh, only 20% of the population. Works containing the stories about Vlad's cruelty were published in Low German in the Holy Roman Empire before 1480. They described Vlad as a demented psycho. Path, a gruesome killer, and a masochist Caligula and Nero. One tale explains that Vlad had a big copper cauldron built and put a lid made of wood with holes in it on top. He put people in the cauldron and put their heads in the holes and fastened them there. He then filled it with water and set a fire under it and let people cry their eyes out until they were boiled to death. And you know, he invited just overall frightening, terrible, unheard of punishments. He ordered that women be impaled together with their suckling young on the same stake, stuck on their mother's breasts until they died. Then he had the woman's breast cut off and put the little ones inside head first, thus he had them impaled together. He impaled victims through the um, rear end till the steak came out of their mouth. A German pamphlet once read that he had young folks roasted and then he would feed them to their mothers and he cut off the breasts of women and forced their husbands to eat them. You know, nightmare cruelty. Number two, Hugh Hefner. While it might not seem shocking that the man who claimed woman empowerment came from seeing them in bunny suits through the male gaze, you know, being a bad guy, just how awful he was may raise some eyebrows. He manipulated and drugged dozens of young women into taking part in degrading act while masquerading as a champion of freedom. He would also host weekly pig nights, during which he would bring in a dozen Schmex workers he considered ugly to have friends. Holly Madison, you know, a lovely woman who dated Hefner for eight years, told how Hefner refused to use protection during and how the Playboy Bunny lifestyle had her considering taking her own life. Linda Lovelace, the 1970s um, adult video star who found fame with the film Deep Throat, said she was treated like a piece of meat and forced to perform oral German Shepherd while Hefner and his friends watched. I could go into more detail, but I don't think I want to. Number one, Gandhi. Yeah, sure, he was an activist who led India to independence, but it also turns out that he was kind of a In the book, The South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, it was revealed that Gandhi was a separatist who wrote to the natal parliament that general belief seems to prevail in the colony that the Indians are a little better, if at all, than savages or the natives of Africa. He later wrote to a health officer in Johannesburg that he was concerned about the mixing of the South Africans with the Indians. If that wasn't awful enough, he frequently used his power to take advantage of young women in their late teens and early 20s. His inappropriate behavior was so bad, it caused his personal secretary, R.P. Paris Suram to blast him in a strongly worded letter. Now, his secretary gave him an ultimatum. Either stop manhandling woman or I'm not working for you anymore. And Gandhi responded by telling him that uh, you're at liberty to leave. Yucky. Number 10, history. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka the Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BCE. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes, and she was only 15 years old when she married the 16-year-old Akhenaten. She worshipped the sun god Aten, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital city called Armana, and she also created a new religion. So, how's that? She ruled over what's considered the wealth wealthiest period in Egypt history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters, which may have had something to do with why we don't know much about her today, but I'll get into that much later on. Number nine, her death. After changing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished, just like that. And on this video, we're gonna try and figure out what may have happened to her. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's legacy. She was gone from everything. Many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather she disguised herself and continued to rule. The next in line after Akhenaten's reign was the pharaoh Smenker. Was that really Nefertiti in disguise? I hope so. That would be pretty sweet if we proved that and figured that out. I'm really rooting for that. The reason we believe that she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh Hatshepsut because they ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century. It's known that they had a big traditional fake beard. It's cool. It's like kind of flashy. I kind of want one. I can't grow a beard or a mustache so I kind of want a fake one myself. Lastly there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. We've gotten closer to uncovering the truth though recently in 2015 when Nicholas Reeves and Mamdou El Damadi found what they think is a hidden doorway in King Tut's tomb that contains perhaps the sarcophagus of the lost 
lost queen. I'll get into that shortly, but first, we need to talk about her modern day origins. Number eight. Berlin bust. Perhaps one of the most popular ancient sculptures of all time was found on December 6, 1913. German archaeologist Ludwig Borchardt found this on the floor of the Royal Sculptures Workshop. This figure has some unforgettable details. I mean, first of all, she's breathtaking to look at, and the blue headpiece. These are all important. It was clear that this was Queen Nefertiti from the start. The German team split everything with the Egyptian government, so currently, this bust is being held in Berlin. It draws in about 50,000 visitors a year to Berlin's newest museum. A little piece of Egypt all the way over there. We love it. Now, fun little fact about this modern bust. In 2009, there were scans done to it. Technology, nice. And it's revealed that underneath this painted layer is limestone carving of a woman so detailed that you can see wrinkles in her cheeks, even a bump on her nose as well. That's very, it's like 4K Egypt. It's crazy. Back in 2016, these two artists secretly 3D scanned the bust of the Lost Queen and then straight up released the files online as a free download. The future is here, I guess. Also, that's that's a little invasive. Just scanning your head, like that's really? But three years later, officials decided to release that to the public, so here it is, take a look. The Queen Nefertiti, 3D bust, scanned by James Bond secretly. Number seven, Monuments Men. It wasn't always a smooth ride for this specific bust. Sometimes it was a bust. I had to, I had to, why not? She spent 11 years in the private residence of Germany's expedition founder, Jacques Simon. Cut to nine years later, that's when King Tut's tomb was discovered, a totally separate event, unbeknownst to them, connected. Howard Carter found King Tut's tomb in 1922, and of course afterwards, the entire world was watching. Just a year later, her bust was finally moved to Berlin. It had a rocky go. It remained in Germans' hands throughout the entire war. Even that big ugly dude with a little mustache said that he himself would never relinquish the head of the queen. So thanks, Spittler. I can't say his name because YouTube. It was hidden in a salt mine throughout the entire Cold War. The Germans would arrive too late though sometimes when stealing rich pieces of art. Like in 1940, for example, they arrived at the Louvre and it was bare. The Mona Lisa was now in a child's bedroom. Curators had moved the pieces, thankfully. But when a bust of a long lost queen of Egypt was being held in a salt mine in the town of Merkers, the monuments men literally saved history. When Sergeant Kenneth C. Lindsay led his team down the 35 miles of tunnel, and aside from the queen's bust, billions of dollars of gold was also found down there, all stolen from the Germans. Number six, hidden chamber. Ancient Egyptian architecture is mind-blowing. Even to this day, we're trying to figure out how exactly everything was built. More and more secrets are coming out of all these hidden tombs. It's fascinating. Technology is for sure a helping hand when it comes to learning about our past queens and kings. And for Queen Nefertiti, her final resting place is now believed to be in a secret chamber in King Tut's tomb. This was years ago. Egypt tourist minister Hisham Zazu said the discovery was like a big bang. And I see no lies. It's perhaps one of the biggest discoveries of the 21st century. After the radar tests were conducted, Egyptian officials were 90% sure they found a hidden chamber. And it was also full of treasure, so that's neat. And also, we're onto something. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology, and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtip. The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner, and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a buck tooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Oof, awkward. Number four, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of Defender of the Faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> Did you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here, too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, Sleeping General. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. 
diplomatic immunity, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Hey, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here, when mom says get out of bed, you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now, when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Queez hit night, blood. That's right, I said it was flooded with it. Each time aside in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We've moved, beyond, we've, we've moved past that now, we've moved past that. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games, and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey, you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not gonna know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did 
a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones. Kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like, a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave for what he wanted. Obviously, this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. Hi, <laughs> number five, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open and for to infect the blood." End quote. So yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number four, prankster king. You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons patronizing brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. 
This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm I'm not funny. I'll leave. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster, end quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. 
you're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you have a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, mother knows best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar, Queen Rana Valona, was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Lova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's... Horrible. Ranalova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. 
At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the 3rd century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the T on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you. Or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup. Like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. Number 10, duels. The Dark Ages, yeah, a lot of fun. Hope you're prepared at all times to defend your home, your family, and your honor. Good luck, you get a really 
sword as well, break a leg or two. Medieval duels were a common spectacle among men. It was a means to settle disputes and display bravery and stand like this and talk like this, of course. Dressed to the nines in armor and tights, knights clashed on horseback and on foot, wielding swords, maces, and shields. I wouldn't be able to carry any of those. My arms would be shaking just trying to hold a shield. They're so heavy. They're so impossibly heavy. These intense one-on-one -on -one bouts were governed by strict rules, often overseen by heralds or nobles. Ah, uh, yes, our noble Joe Rogan will oversee this bout. Now bump fists. Ping. Duels showcased a knight's honor with victory, bringing respect to the land. Yeah, you gotta bring that respect back to your land or else you're not coming back to that land. The outcomes impacted social standing and reputation. While duels had its risks, it was an integral part of medieval culture. So go support your medieval times, dudes. Go eat some chicken and watch an $80 show. They're pretty fun. I haven't been yet. Number nine, falconry. This one's pretty bad. So when you think of the dark ages and the jobs that were available, we often forget about this one. This one's pretty cool. Falconry was a popular pastime among noblemen during the medieval period and involved the training and hunting with birds of prey, such as falcons, but also hawks. But hawkonry doesn't sound as cool, so we gotta say falconry. Rolls off the tongue. Rolls off thy tongue. These noble hunters formed a deep bond with their feathered companions through meticulous training. Now falcons, prized for their speed agility, and keen eyesight, these were used to pursue and capture smaller game. Falconry served as both a prestigious sport, but also a practical method of acquiring food because, well, Uber didn't exist back then. But you know what we had? A guy with a falcon that we can trust. A scary man with a falcon who'd walk around and, and grill you all day. Number eight. Tights. I don't know why I said it so angry. I'm like, tights. In medieval times, men wearing tights was a fashion trend that reflected social status and style. I got a pair of tights for running, and I'll be honest, I've never felt more like a knight in my entire life. Pull them up tight as a knight. Let's do this. Tights were originally worn for practical purposes, like keeping warm and having an ease of movement, of course, but tights gradually became a symbol of high fashion among the upper classes. Of course. Can we do that with sweatpants now? Can we? I feel like we're close. They accentuated the physique and showcased a man's wealth and refined taste, you can say. Sure, we'll get onto that in a little bit. Yeah, all of that in one pair of tights. How lucky were we? Tights were often brightly colored, sometimes even covered in fun patterns. They're your tights. You're living in them. Get creative. Why not? This fashion statement eventually influenced modern day styles. So next time you see a jogger, just think that's a noble knight right there running to his next bout with his water belt. Number seven, cod pieces. Since we're talking about tights, let's talk about what we stuffed inside said pants said pantaloons. In medieval history, cod pieces were a peculiar fashioned accessory, trend, whatever. They were worn by men. Now these padded or stuffed coverings were designed to protect, but also emphasize the groin area. And it got really stupid. They really got carried away with it. It became a joke almost immediately. Originally serving a practical purpose, cod pieces eventually became exaggerated and decorative, symbolizing masculinity. Again, all while wearing tights, which is so funny. What a sight to see. Some guy wearing like the biggest cup you've ever seen. You're like, this isn't cool. You don't look like a really cool guy right now. Why is yours so bumpy? You should go see the local barber and get that checked out. Uh, their size and prominence varied over time with some, of course, reaching comical proportions portions, covering them in diamonds, studs. Like, you know, it doesn't look, that doesn't look good, man. Hashtag not hot, get out of here. Number six, public bathing. Bathing establishments, such as a bathing house or a communal tub, these provided a place for men to gather and cleanse themselves. It was so disgusting. Now you think guys are gross now in the washroom and whatever goes on in there. Back then, these gatherings were considered a social gathering where men would interact, relax, and discuss various matters. Official means, okay? Watching a guy washes behind while he's pitching you a beard tax. You're like, okay, sure, perfect place for a meeting. Let's do it. Mind if I cover up first? Weirdo. The act of bathing back then was seen as both a physical and a spiritual purification. Ah, uh, yes, so spiritual. All this is really transcending me. I love it. Let's go home and plan some stuff. While nudity was not unusual back in these settings, modesty was still valued just a smidgen. So individuals would often use towels or cloths for some level of privacy during these meetings. Thank God. How vulnerable is that? Like, hey, any ideas? You're like, yeah, man, I'm naked. Why don't we get dressed first? Here's my idea. Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means 
way back. I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day, and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rocked the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, that's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died, spoiler alert. So the older, the better at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction. And then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrett, only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6, 1540. Anne later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. Last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now, as a young end, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. 